literature under the Spanish colonization from 1565 to 1897, presented by Group 2 of Sibet 22504P. Where it began, the history of the Philippines from 1521 to 1898, also known as the Spanish colonial period, the rule of the cross and the sword, is a period during which Spain controlled the Philippine Islands as the Captain C. General of the Philippines. Initially under New Spain until Mexican independence in 1821, which gave Madrid direct control over the area. It was also known as Spanish East Indiesto, the colonialist. Spanish colonization still started with the arrival in 1521 of European explorer Ferdinand Magellan, sailing for Spain which heralded a period when the Philippines was a colon of the Spanish Empire and ended with the outbreak of the Philippine Revolution in 1898, which it marked the beginning of the American colonial era of Philippine history. Spanish colonization of the Philippines started in 1565, which is during the time of Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, he is the first Spanish governor general in the Philippines. This is also literature started to flourish during this time. Doctrina Cristiana This spirit continued and abated until the Cavite Revolt in 1872. At the close of the 19th century, the body of written Philippine literature was in general largely religious, consisting of poems, and homiletic essays printed in Catholic pamphlets and newspapers. Doctrina Christiana is the first book published in the Philippines. So Doctrina Christiana was translated in English or also known as the Doctrine of the Christians published in 1593 which is composed of Catholic poems and homiletic essays and it also has have poems on it. Catholic films, which also we know that the Spaniards influences us with their religion, which is Catholic or Christianism. The Philippine Doctrina Christiana was written by Fray Juan de Placencia on Roman Catholic Catechism. The Dominicans employed the service of Chinese Ganyong from Binondo, Chinatown, who had Painting experience in China. Two versions of the book were printed in Spanish and Tagalog, written in Roman letters and Tagalog by Bain, with 76 pages. Spanish or Chinese, written in Roman letters and Chinese characters, with 124 pages. Doctrina Christiana priced at 2 and 4 reals. They were printed using Silographic. Silographic means a relief process printing each page of text from one hand carved wood block. So this is a sample picture of Doctrina Christiana. Doctrina Christiana copies are you can also find Doctrina Christiana in Madrid, Spain. Uh, one of the copy of this was in the US. Uh, I don't. I can't remember who bought it from an auction in Paris. Literary forms during Spanish colonization. Hello, guys. Um, my name is Remer Garcia. Um, uh, my report is about Corrido. Uh, ano nga ba yung meaning ng Corrido? Um, ang Corrido is a legendary religious narrative form that usually details the lives of saints or the history of a tradition. Um, ang corrido um, is a Spanish word. Means a uh, metrical story usually sang to the accompaniment of a guitar in Pandanga style. And also, um, corrido, corrido was derived from the Spanish occurrido, meaning uh, events 
or happenings. Cordo refers to metrical romances. In octosyllabic, there are eight syllables. Birds called hakera. And Corridor were usually on legends or stories from European countries like France, Spain, Italy, and Greece. Uh, corridor refers to narration. Uh, for example, ng Corridor, uh, Ibong Adarna by Jose de la Cruz. Uh, ito yung example lines ng Corridor. Uh, Oberhen ka ibig ibig na naming nasa langit, liwanag ni siyaring isip, nang sa layo'y di malhis. Uh, ayan yung example ng korido. At uh, dito na po uh, nagtatapos yung aking report. Maraming salamat po sa pakikinig. So one of the literary forms of the Philippine literature during the Spanish colonization is awit or song. Awit or song. So, awit is a literary form of Philippine literature. It is a metrical romance formed in dodecasyllabic verse. Dodecasyllabic verse means this is a 12 syllable verse. It refers to chanting and awit or song, fabricated stories from writers' imagination to the setting and characters are European. And bas- so basically, um, awit or song uh, was f- made into 12-syllable verse. And the best example for this is the Florantet Laura of Francisco Balagdas, which we will tackle next. So, Francisco Balagdas Baltazar. As we all know, Francisco Baltazar is the principe ng Makatang Tagalog because... As we all know, he is, he is good at doing balagtasan. In 1835, he fell in love with Maria Asuncion Rivera, a daughter of one of the richest family in Pandacan. Uh, also, Francisco Baltazar was from Biga a Bulacan. He, uh, he just came in Manila to pursue his education. Kay Celia, a poem for Rivera, the, op- the opening poem in Florante at Laura. But in the end, they didn't end up with each other. So basically, uh, if you see the Florante at Laura, you can see a poem uh, which uh, Francisco Baltasar offers for Rivera, entitled Caecelia. So Florante at Laura is the best example of a song or a wit poem. Florante et Laura. This is the uh, illustration of Florante et Laura. Great social and political changes in the world work together to make Balagtas career as a poet. The Industrial Revolution had caused a great movement of commerce in the globe, creating wealth and opportunity for material improvement in the life of the working classes. With these great material changes, social values were transformed allowing greater social mobility. Florante et Laura Steele, um, his narrative poem, Florante et Laura, written in sublime Tagalog, is about tyranny in Albania, but it is also perceived to be about tyranny in his Filipino homeland, Numbera. So basically, Florante et Laura was inspired by how Balagtas saw the Races in between the uh, Spaniards and the Filipinos, as we all know, bef- uh, before way back before the Spanish period, the Spaniards uh, calls us calls us as an Indio, which is a low class uh, person, a low class, which is a low class in the society. So Balagtas made Florante Laura to address this issue in the form of a narrative poem. And basically, Florante Laura, as you can see, is not just about love, but this also 
for nationalism, for the love of the con of the co of our country. Despite the foreign influence, however, he remained true to his native traditions. His verse plays were performed to the motley crowd. His poems were sung by the literate for the benefit of the unlettered. The metrical regularity and the rhyme performed their age-old mnemonic function, despite and because of the introduction of printing. So just what I have said, Florante at Laura was written in a 12 syllable verse uh, each verse as you can count on the poem it counts as a 12 syllables so this is a sample act of Florante et Laura uh, these were the actors of Cantimpala Theater uh, they performed Florante et Laura Bakit naririto? Hindi ba't marapat na nasa palaso at Conde Adolfo ang kayakap mo? Hindi ba't ang mga puso ay sumisinta? Hindi ba't nagbabalak na makasalpa? Paano ang Conde ang kinakasama pagbibintang ang nag-aatid nasa? Ay, Laura Boy, bakit sa sinuyo sa iba ang sinta sa aking mga ako? Pinagliluhan mo ang tapat na puso. Pinanggugulan mo ng luhang tumulo. Katiwala ko ay iyong karektan, kapilas ng langit, anak ay matibay. Tapat ang puso mo't di magunang-gunang na ang paglililoy na sa kagandahan. Kailanman ay hindi ako sumira sa pag-ibig sa'yo at sa aking sumpa. Sinta'y maniwala. Sintang Florante, sa aking mga tinuran, langit kong saksi. Kung ako'y naglilo sa konding kumasi, ngayon din kitlin ang buhay kong api. Ako ay binulak ng mga hinala. Ako'y patawarin o laura kong mutya. So, hi guys, good afternoon. So, today I am going to report about Sinaholo. By the way, my name is Iligan Jen Stephen A. And yeah, I am going to report Sinaholo, which is part of the Spanish colonization literature. So, let's get started. So, Sinaholo or Sinaholo. So, Sinaholo, which is actually came from the Spanish word Sinaholo, which means Senacal, the place where Jesus Christ celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. The Senacal is also known as the Upper Room, is a room in Jerusalem traditionally to be the site of the Last Supper. So, the word 
is a derivative of a Latin senio, which means leaner. So this one, this is actually a photo of the Seneca. This is located at the outside of the old city of the Jerusalem on Mount Zion. So as you can see the Seneca, it actually has a lot of renovation through the years. So this is the Senachel. This is actually the Last Supper, the painting of Da Vinci, which is Christ is doing the Last Supper with his 12 disciples at the Senachel. So what is Senacholo? So Senacholo is depicts the event happen from the Old and the New Testament. The Sinaholo is traditionally performed in stage. So it is a reenactment with painted cloth or paper backdrops or called telon or telon. So just to give you a quick idea, Sinaholo here in the Philippines is famous because of course of our faith on our religion. So Sinaholo. Silaholo is a Lenten play that is dramatic presentation of the Passion of Christ, His trials, sufferings, and death. So, when Sinaholo started, it actually got started in the year 1904 in Barrio Dayap, which is Presently, the area covering three barangays in Cainta, the Santo Domingo, Santo Nino, and Santa Rosa resident. But the most famous place where the Sinaholo place are in Malibay at Pasay City. So, thousands of people came there during the Lenten season just to witness the Sinaholo. So, when Sinaholo happens... The event actually lasts a total of 8 nights beginning on Palm Sunday and culminating on Easter Sunday or also known as Semana Santa. But this is the tradition. This tradition is actually still alive but some places here in the Philippines actually they cut it like for just two days and some actually have the Sinaholo for or the reenactment of Sinaholo just for two hours they just summarize it and get the important details on the life and sufferings of Jesus Christ for the last 12 hours of his life so street Sinaholo so street Sinaholo is another form of penance where the people are walking with the procession so penance is actually means as penitentia this is actually common here in the Philippines the penance because they are believing that if they do like penitentia thing they will just get a miracle or a blessing from God which is their belief and I'm not against them about it let's just respect everyone's belief right some of this like penitential thing is like fasting and some of them are actually like they're doing reenactment on the street like they're acting like they're God and there's a Roman soldiers behind them trying to hurt them with the cross on their arms so i hope you are familiar with that and some of them were actually have this what do you call this thing the like the nails and then they are tapping it on their back until it bleeds and some people are walking just barefoot until they're their feet bled, bleeds. So, I have here a photos of Street Sinaholo. So, as you can see here, there are 
the people who acted like their Jesus Christ they have the cross on their arm and the Roman soldiers behind them trying to hurt them so the importance of Sinaholo one of the greatest traits of us Filipinos are being religious yo yes it's true before the Spaniard came we have already religions here in the Philippines well we can't actually call it a religion because we're believing in like we're doing already rituals from the for the Anito and Anita and Islam were already alive before the Spaniards games and it is already part of our tradition and help us to have more faith in our religion so it help us to have more bond with our religion which is Catholic because seeing and reenactment reenactment of the life of God and also it help us and also other people to repent our sins and their sins through the penance or some other doing fasting fasting and penitentia so for me Sinaholo is a devotion. It is a story of salvation. This is not just in an imagination or a fiction story. It is a true story. A good way to share the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Just to save us from our sins. Right? I think that's all for Sinaholo. Thank you. So, just to add more information about Sinaholo. So, Sinaholo is written octosyllabic, in octosyllabic verse with 8 verses to the stanza. So, meaning, octosyllabic means that it is written in lines that have 8 syllables. So, next. So, the Sinaholo have two kinds. So, the two kinds of Sinaholo is the Cantada and the Hablada. So, let's go first in Hablada. So, in, ha- in the hablada, hablada, the lines are spoken in a more deliberate manner, showing more rhythmic measure of each verses, and the, rit- the rhyming in each stanza has more dignified in theme. Whilst, on the other hand, the cantada is more enchanted like the passion. So, that's all. Thank you. Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Melan B. Loigos and my report is all about Moro Moro. So, Moro Moro. In the 18th century, secular literature from Spain in the form of medieval ballads inspired a native poetic drama form called the Comedia, later to be called Moro Moro because this often dealt or dealt with the theme of Christians triumphing over Muslims. So Jose de la Cruz uh, from time 1746 to 1829 was the foremost exponent of the Comedia during his time. A poet of prodigious output and urbane style, de la Cruz marks a turning point in that his elevated diction distinguishes his work from folk idioms. So, as for instance that of Gaspar Aquino de Belen. Yet his appeal to the non-literature was universal. The popularity of dramatic form of which he was a master was due to it being experienced as performance both by the lettered minority and illiterate but genuinely appreciative majority. 
So I will show you the uh, example of Moro Moro. Noong ding 92, humalik si Rizal sa Pilipinas upang palaganapin ang La Liga Filipina. Ngunit nahuli si Rizal noong Hulyo ng taong iyon. Halos kasabay na rin sumulpot ang katipunan sa tondo. Layunin ng organisasyon ang pagpapatalsik sa Espanya mula sa Pilipinas sa pamamagitan ng dahas. Noong 95, itinatag ang unang sangay ng katipunan sa Mololos. Hello everyone, I'm Isabel P. Henya Lope. So let's proceed to my topic which is Carillo. That is one of those recreational plays performed by Filipinos during the Spanish times. So let's proceed. So what is Carillo? Carillo or shadow play is a form of dramatic entertainment performed on a moonless night during a town of fiesta or on dark nights after a harvest. So this shadow play is made by projecting cardboard figures before a lamp against a white sheet. So sinasabi na yung shadow play is isa siya sa pinakamatandang forma ng sini. Ayun nga, ginagamitan siya ng card projecting cardboard um, para makita yung shadow play, yung pinapalabas. So the figures are move like marionettes whose dialogues are produced by some experts. The dialogues are drawn from a corridor or awit or some religious play interspersed with songs. So, marionettes means ko siya yung, kumakont yung kumakontrol sa kanya mula sa itaas um, kung gumagamit ng string or wires. Sa iba ba naman, kung ginagamit naman, um, stick lang. Basta depende siya sa regional variation. So, shadow puppet theater likely originated in Central Asia, China, or in India in the first millennium BCE. So, sinasabi nila na yung shadow play talaga, nagsimula talaga daw siya sa China, particularly nung Han Dynasty. So, yung kwento nun or yung history nun is may isang emperor daw na namatayan ng contrabands. So, para sumaya siya, um, they decided na gumawa ng shadow play. So, kaya mula noon, naging tradisyon siya, hindi lang sa China, pati na rin sa iba't ibang panig ng bansa. So, next. Um, Carillo in the Philippines. Puppetry in the Philippines started since the time of Dr. Jose Rizal, our national hero, when he staged the play entitled Carillo or Shadow Puppetry. So, um, si Rizal um, used a carton and a stick and he placed this at the back of a white lot. So, anyway, instead na whiteboard yung ginamit niya, um, ginamit niya naman is yung white lot. So, si Rizal talaga yung parang um, isa sa nag-introduce ng shadow play noong during Spanish time. Um, so, in the town of Angono, the giant puppets are well known. So, ayun, kilala din yung mga um, yung puppet sa Angono, which is giant naman yun. So, this these are made of paper mache and bamboo sticks. They are using this in celebrating the feast of St. Clementine every last Sunday of November. Aside from tra traditional puppetry, there were puppet groups formed since 1972 up to present. So these groups were inspired by different puppetry art in other countries and those children programs seen on the movies and televisions. So next, so um, these are the equipments na ginagamit nila para sa shadow play. Puppet, whiteboard or white cloth, lamp, and light form. So next. So these are the various names in different places. Carillo sa Manila, sa Rizal, sa Batangas, and Laguna. Titre sa Ilocos Norte, Pangasinan, Bataan, Capiz, and Negros. Titiri naman sa Zambales, 
gagalaw or kikimot sa Pampanga or Tarlac and Tarlac ali-ala naman sa La Union. So, ito naman yung mga countries na uh, nagbiplay ng shadow play. So, which are Indonesia, Thailand, China, Turkey, Greece, France, Malaysia, Cambodia, Egypt, Syria, Germany, United States. So, yung karilyo talaga, originally na name talaga, entitled talaga sa Pilipinas, yung, yung name na karilyo. Pero, um, sa ibang bansa, um, iba yung tawag, shadow, shadow play, um, shadow puppetry, ganun. So, yun lang. And that's all. Thank you. In those days, Cesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged in the house. Today I'm, go I'm Aubrey Hibai, and I'm going to report one of the literature on the Spanish colonial. Before we get started, I would like to let you know that we still have the existing literature of the Philippine ethnic groups of the time of the conquest and conversion into Christianity was mainly oral, consisting of epics, legends, songs, riddles, and proverbs. And the one that I'm going to report is about the tibag. The word tibag means to excavate, on in the simplest word that would be to dig. This ritual was brought here by the Spaniard to remind the people about the search for St. Helena for the cross on which Jesus died. So about St. Helena of the cross, she is the patron saint of new discoveries and she was recognized on this becoming of the patron saint because of the search that she did for the cross on which Jesus died. And St. Helena, or also called as Helen, born on Bithynia, Asia Minor. So in, in the present day, that will be the, the northern Turkey in the Southeast Asian part. And St. Helena of the Cross is the Roman Empress who was the reputed discoverer of Christ's cross. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jinmarie P. Sabedra, and I'm going to report to you the Karagatan in Duplo. Karagatan in Duplo is a game that perform for their dead loved ones. It's usually done to ease the pain and sadness of their friends or relatives that pass away. Karagatan is poetic vehicle of a social, religious nature celebrated during the death of a person. It was recognized as a old form of literature it called as poetic play or tulang dulaan and also called as dulang pantahanan because it was performed inside the house or in the backyard of the dead person. It's usually done to give tribute to them. It is competition in poetry. They base on the legend of Sing Sing ng isang dalaga na nahulog sa gitna ng dagat wherein the story is about a young lady willing to marry a boy who can give her her ring. In this game, hindi na kailangan sumisid ng binata. All he need is um, galing sa pakikipagtalastasan at pagsagot sa tanong ng dalaga. May dalawang papag sa magkabila ng isang mesang may sari-saring pagkain. Usually, yung lalaki yung nagsisimula ng game. Pwede ding magbunutan para mapili yung binata na una magbibigay sa dalaga ng talinhaga o kaya naman um, mapili ang binata base sa natatapatan ng tabong may tandang puti. Ito ang example ng karagatan.
The other one is Tuplo. It is replaced the Karagatan. This is a poetic battle in speaking and reasoning. It is also a contest of poetry and recognized as Tulang Patrigan. The players are called Tuplero for the boys and Duplera for the girls. But once the play started, um, they called themselves as Bilyako and Bilyaka. The Palmatoria is a sleeper used by the king as punishment. The punishment based to a person that has the longest prayer for the soul of the dead person. The topic is about sinawawalang loro ng hari. The player should be fast think thinker because it is played impromptu. So, here is the example of Duplo.
Good afternoon everyone, my name is Jessie Hira Marie S. Losantas and I am here to report about Zarzuela. Zarzuela, often defined as Spanish opera, is a theatrical play that contains musical acts. Characters usually represent the working classes, chulos, translated as men wearing peculiar clothes and making extravagant gestures, ratas, translated as thieves, and nannies, policemen, etc. Composers of Zarzuelas Early Times In 1657, at the Royal Palace of El Pardo, King Philip IV of Spain, Queen Mariana and their court attended the first performance of a new comedy by Pedro Calderón de la Barca with music by Juan de Hidalgo. El Laurel de Apollo traditionally symbolizes the birth of a new musical genre which had become known as La Zarzuela. To add more information, La Zarzuela is derived from the Spanish word zarzas, translated in English as brambles. La Zarzuela was often visited by clowns and actors from the city of Madrid and perhaps the piece Calderon and Hidalgo provided, running the theatrical gamut from classical opera to low slapstick and popular song. A bit like Dryden's work with Purcell in England, reminded the creatures of a typical La Zarzuela entertainment. Calderon, the greatest playwright of the day. Hidalgo, the best Spanish composer. They ushered in a new swiftly developed form of Baroque entertainment in which witty, pithy libretti were to be matched by music of high quality and extraordinary diversity. A charming example is Viento es la dicha de amor, translated in English as Wind is the Poetry of Love in 1743, with music by José de Nebra. A mixture of blank verse and prose, opera arias, short choruses with a flavor of Monteverdi, popular songs with castanets and delectably orchestrated instrumental interludes. The coming of Italian opera composers made the native form increasingly unfashionable. Though, as late as 1786, Boccherini wrote a sorsuela for the palace of La Puerta de la Vaga in Madrid, La Clementina is a scandalously neglected masterpiece of Spanish lyric theater to a libretto by the poet Ramon de la Cruz, the Spanish rival to Metastasio. Clearly, the Zarzuela was still worthy of the highest talents Spain could muster. After a follow period, money was short and Spain reduced to a low ebb of prosperity, artistic creativity, and morale. We reach the second half of the 19th century the golden age of the Zarzuela. As at first, the essence of the new flowering was the exotic mixture of genres. Zarzuela is not going to appeal to anyone who likes their theater purely one thing or the other. The classic pieces of the time are a potent brew of sophisticated musical ensembles and arias, mixed in with verse and prose dialogue, popular songs and low-life comedy characters. Some are long and operatic in scope, the Genero Grande. Others are short, often gently titillating one-act farces, mostly set in the less salubrious parts of Madrid, parts all too well known to many of the pleasure-seeking men in the audience, at least. These are immensely popular Sainete and Genero Chico Zarzuelas. In between, there are Zarzuelas of all shapes and sizes, overflowing with every flavor of musical theater. To add more information, Sainete was a comedy skit that used music as an intermission to the long comedies of the 19th century. While Genero Chico is a Spanish literary genre of light dramatic or operatic one-act playlets, and lastly, Genero Grande is a serious drama or opera. Francisco Asenjo Barbieri, properly regarded as the musical founding father of the 19th century movement, Wrote Zarzuelas which remind us of Rossini, Donizetti, Viennese Operetta, and even Gilbert and Sullivan. Compare, for example, the troupe of policemen in his masterpiece, El Barberillo de Lavapies, 
with their roughly contemporary colleagues in the Pirates of Penzance. With Barbieri, as with his great contemporaries such as Breton, Chapi, Chueca, and Caballero, musical originality is not as high a priority as vitality, theatrically, and sophisticated style. And as with Sullivan in England, these composers are at their best when, paradoxically, they seem to be taking things easiest. Their individual flavor comes across more strongly in the Cerezuelas than in their more serious concert, church, and operatic works. There is a single reason for this. It lies in one fact, Madrid. The spirit, sights and sounds of the capital, pervade nearly all the great Cerezuelas, large or small, from this classic period and of many from the 20th century. Even the composers who came from outside the city or the country, Boccherini, through the Basque greedy, became steep in its heady atmosphere. Madrileño's heart and soul just as much as the natives such as Chueca or the great writer Perez de Galdos. Many of the very best Zarzuelas take their life from their Madrileño setting, including Breton's classic La Verbena de la Paloma and Chapi's equally beloved La Revoltosa. The 20th century. The first half of the new century saw the repertory enriched by a huge quantity of work. Some of the composers, Vives, Sorozabal, Toroba, are at least a match technically and imaginatively for the previous generation. The 20th century sees a diversification of the range of the Zarzuela. Tragic verissimo shockers like Las Golondrinas by Ozan Dizaga. Jostling with exotic operetta, Luna's El Niño Judio, and small town musical Guerrero's Los Gavillanes. Yet the most enduring works of the 1920s and 30s, Vives Doña Francisquita and Torobas Luisa Fernanda, are firmly rooted in the Madrileño tradition, with its tonadillas, pandangos, and habaneras. These composers, with others of at least equal popularity, such as Serrano and Alonso, we're well aware of contemporary trends in Italian, French, and German music without ever losing sight of the debt they owed to their great Spanish predecessors. This lends their as well as a flavor unlike anything else in the operatic repertory. With the onset of the Civil War, the Zarzuela is more or less played out as a vital form. Only the evergreen and chameleon Soros Sabal kept the form alive into the 1950s, and his later productions such as Civil War Allegory, Black El Payaso, and the urbane Don Manolito increasingly come to resemble Broadway musicals as much as earlier Zarzuelas. The legacy of nearly 100 years and thousands of works remains incomparably rich. Writers of Zarzuelas 17th century Much has been written about the composers of Zarzuela, very much less about the merits of the writers who put their place at the musician's service. Yet the text is the main vehicle for the comedy, the satire, the drama, the characters, and their feelings at every period of the Zarzuela. In most cases, at least half of the running time will be straight theater without music. These texts vary from brilliant to anodyne or worse, but the finest writers created a body of work which sets the Spanish lyric theater apart from the comparable forms. Many of the playwrights of the Spanish Golden Age gave space to music within their theatrical work. This is a period where inertia in scientific studies was mirrored by brilliant innovation in literature and the arts, and Lope de Vega led the way in allowing music in a new dynamism within the drama. During the career of his successor, Pedro Calderón de la Barca, we see first native works striving to strike a balance between words and music. With Calderón, that the history of the Zarzuela begins, a history dominated in the 17th century by verse texts on mythological and quasi-historical topics, but with that same admixture of popular elements that has characterized Zarzuela throughout its existence. 18th century The onslaught of Italian opera gradually forced native opera into smaller compass, and the 18th century is the high-water mark of the short tonadilla and sainete.
the equivalents of the Italian intermezzi such as La Serva Padrona and Pimpinone. The outstanding writer of Tonadillas was Ramon de la Cruz, whose text broke the mythological mold of earlier times by reflecting popular life and speech. Short, with little plot, character was the mainstay of the Tonadilla, the bud which was to blossom into all-conquering Genero Chico late in the following century. The Zarzuela itself went into temporary eclipse. Longer native examples by De La Cruz and others adopted Italian models as to versification, style, and content. Early 19th century Not until the 1850s does the full-length native drama resurface. The growth of nationalist consciousness brought about the birth of the modern or romantic Zarzuela, a mighty movement in which writers such as Ventura de la Vega, Luis de Olona, Luis Mariano de Lara, and Francisco Camprodon were at least as proactive as their better-known musical colleagues. French was the dominant cultural force of the time, and these playwrights drew their plots more or less from French romantic plays, mixing aristocratic cultures with their servants in populist settings. Their chosen form was the three-act Zarzuela Grande. Their chosen literary means was elegant, formal verse. Late 19th century A return to the aesthetic of Ramon de la Cruz, led by Ventura's son Ricardo de la Vega, brought about another shift in the literary course of Zarzuela. Genero Chico, translated in English as little, by virtue of length, not quality or potential complexity. Writers tended to write such pieces in one act, lasting about an hour. Originally, they were text only, but music was soon incorporated. Subject matter is simple, clear and comedic, mixing sentimental and cynical, romantic and realistic, machismo with submission to the superior intelligence of women. The prime characteristic of Genero Chico is its roots in Madrileño culture, the life of the people, presented for the people. First drama gives way to vernacular prose, rhyme, and meter being reserved for the cantables, or song parts. Certain words and expressions, otherwise without meaning, made their appearance in these cantable sections. Inevitably, many texts from this period are superficial, implausible, and slipshod, relying on cheap vulgarity and easy laughs. Still, many good writers emerged during this new golden age, admirable for their fluent dialogue, clear characterization and wit, as well as their facility to dub build books and lyrics seamlessly. Of these, Carlos Arniches was the greatest, though the Alvarez Quintero brothers, Miguel Echagaray, Guillermo Perrin, and Miguel Palacios, Miguel Ramos Carrion, are almost equally noteworthy. 20th Century After the first decade of the new century, the focus of Zarzuela again changes. The three-act Zarzuela Grande reappears. The influence of Viennes operetta, with its exotic settings and situations, pervades the Madrileño Genero Chico. Sophisticated literary content becomes the norm, as Zarzuela comes to be more carefully planned in contrast to the revistas translated in English as reviews, which were quickly written and performed to popular audiences without much thought as to artistic longevity. Figures such as Federico Romero and Guillermo Fernandez Shaw, Anselmo Cuadrado Carreño, and Luis Fernandez de Sevilla carried on the work of the best Zarzuela playwrights, employing scrupulous and varied theatrical craft, sophisticated versification and structure, plus an awareness of the great tradition from which they had emerged. If these later writers occasionally lack the fresh, vital originality of the earlier generation, they make up for it in solid technique and consistency. The characteristics of Zarzuela are the following. First, Include songs, courses, spoken passage, and dances. Second, subject matter revolves around heroic or mythological topics. Third, it is quick-witted and satirical. And lastly, usually written in colloquial prose containing anywhere between one and five acts. Baroque Zarzuela have been popular between 1630 and 1750, while Romantic Zarzuela was popular between 1850 and 1950. Zarzuela in the Philippines Zarzuela is a form of theater to the Philippines, 
However, it wasn't until the Spanish colonization when Spanish performers introduced Sarswellas to the nation and they quickly made their own. In addition to having roots in the Spanish genre, Filipinos also drew inspiration from local Sainete. Although the local Sainete has impacted Sarswellas, the Spanish Sarswellas are the real inspiration behind the Filipino art form. 1869. After the opening of the Suez Canal that allowed the Spanish much easier access to the Philippine Islands, theater really began to take off. This meant that in addition to bringing more troops, the Spanish also sent over playwrights and acting groups to perform for the Spanish population residing in the Philippines. This inspired many Filipinos to begin writing their own form of zarzuelas. At first, they were written and performed in Spanish. Then Filipinos began to write them in Tagalog, but they would still be performed in Spanish. Finally, as theatrical form became popular among the Filipino community, they started to do in their national language. Another research is based on the 7th volume of the Cultural Center of the Philippines, Encyclopedia of Philippine Art. The Zarzuela was brought to Manila in 1879 with the performance of Hugar con Fuego, translated in English as Play with Fire, by the troupe of Dario de Cespedes and the El Barberillo de Lavapies, translated in English, The Little Barber of Lavapies. The complete Filipinization of the form came when the Zarzuela unfolded topics that concerned the Filipinos and written in the Filipino languages. Among the first Zarzuelas that were recorded are Budhin Nagpahamak in 1890, Ang Pagtabang ni San Miguel by Norberta Romualdez in 1899, Awaray Zarzuela, Ing Managpe by Mariano Proceso in 1900, Sailima na Pampinchonan in 1901, written in Pangasinan, and Mapuchug May Tum by Vicente Soto in 1902, which was written in Sabuano. Among the major Zarzuelas of the Philippines, the most famous was Severino Reyes' Walang Sugat in 1902. It is about lovers separated by the cruelty of friars and the revolution against Spain. So that ends our report. Thank you and have a good day.